Welcome to the European Market Open, everyone. A minute to go until the start of cash equity trading. I'm Francie Lacroix in London with Tom McKenzie. Hey, Ron, your top stories. Powell picked again. President Biden sticks with the Fed chair and elevates Lael Brainard to vice chair. Treasury yields and the dollar jump. Markets price in a full quarter point rate hike into the June Fed meeting. And vaccinated, cured or dead, Germany's health minister issues a stark warning for winter as Angela Merkel calls the latest COVID surge the worst ever. Now, Tom, there's a lot to talk about, certainly in terms of lockdowns. Let's also look at the futures, a little bit of a mixed bag. Now, yesterday we did see a repricing yesterday in terms of rates expectations in the U.S. Now, if you look at industries, they kind of change depending on the exposure you have, whether it's China or the U.S. DAX futures, European stocks futures down some 0.9 percent. Again, we have PMIs in the U.S. will give us a good indication of what happens with inflation, um, expectations and growth. And that, again, we could see a bit more repricing. And then the strategic reserves of oil, they could be Released. The oil story is fascinating, isn't it? We'll see how that plays into the equity markets as well. We'll keep across the oil space for you. And in terms of what you were saying, Fran, those voices that you're hearing now around the space of the Fed table, we heard that from Bostick as well. He would be comfortable with a more aggressive tapering. And you're getting the markets pricing in that June hike of uh, two, two tenths uh, or 0.25 uh, of a percent. In terms of the data they're watching, manufacturing data out of France and Germany. France is at quarter past the hour. The CAC is down six tenths of a percent. Here in the UK, the FTSE 100 is down three tenths. We'll watch basic resources. Iron ore is up today following the gains yesterday around some more positive sentiment about maybe relaxing curbs on the property market in China. The Spanish IBEX is down almost two tenths of a percent. We can look at the cross assets then. Oil certainly in focus. This tug of war between OPEC plus and the US president, the White House, but also the likes of Japan, India, South Korea and China in terms of the release of reserves. We're watching that story very closely indeed. Brent currently down five tenths of a percent at $79 a barrel. The futures in the US are pointing lower to two tenths of a percent after it was technology and particularly those Companies that are not yet making a profit dragging things lower on the NASDAQ, and that was the pressure. All of this tying into what's happening in the yield space, of course, and you've got a three basis point rise for the US two year at zero at 61 for the two year. That is one firmly to watch as the expectations around potentially a more aggressive taper continue, and as markets price in uh, potentially three hikes next year. That is the shape of play. Iron ore up 4% building on the price increases that we saw yesterday. Let's get out to the Bloomberg Business Flash then and Laura Wright. Laura. Government is set to temporarily take over the running of gas and electricity supplier Bulb as the energy crunch deepens. <laughs> Regulator Ofgem will ensure uninterrupted supplies to Bulb's 1.7 million customers by appointing a special administrator with costs supported by the government. Soaring energy prices have caused 21 suppliers to collapse since August. Samsung Electronics is reportedly planning to build a $17 billion chip-making plant in the Texas city of Taylor, about 30 miles from its existing factory in Austin. The new facility could create around 1,800 jobs with chip output expected to start by the end of 2024. UK-based Atom Bank is moving to a four-day working week, one of the most dramatic flexible working policies introduced by a finance firm since the pandemic upended office norms. The fintech, which has 430 employees, says a contractual working hours will be reduced by three and a half hours to 34 hours per week with no change in salary. 
Zoom's quarterly sales forecast has beaten expectations, signaling its video conferencing platform remains in demand. The company expects fourth quarter revenue of more than $1 billion after sales jumped 35% in the previous quarter. Investors have been watching whether Zoom can sustain its popularity as many in-person activities resume and competition rises. I thought Zoom fatigue was over, Tom Bronstein. Zoom fatigue. I mean, we've I've had it for like seven months and counting. Laura right in London with the very latest on Zoom and some of the other corporates we're also watching. Now, a lot of action in the markets today. I mean, it was amazing actually to see some of the repricing when it came to bond yields, but also uh, the dollar in the wake yeah. of the decision that everyone was waiting for. A lot of people were, I was actually surprised the fact that he renominated to Jay Powell, but it feels like we're on firmer footing just because he's been there for a while. So it, it should be smooth as they continue. The, the commentary had all been, look, there's not much space between them when it comes to monetary policy. It was all about yeah. banking regulation and yet the market seem to have priced in yeah. the options of maybe a more dovish lineup yeah. at the Fed. They didn't get that, and so you get a repricing. Yeah, and I think the thinking is, even if they weren't further apart in terms of dovishness, if you just start actually in a new job, it's very difficult to, to go ahead or start tapering. True. So maybe at the margins, it would have made a difference. Now, we also spoke exclusively to the Atlanta Fed president, Rafael Bostic, after the announcement that Powell would be the next pick. This decision really does take some uncertainty out of the Federal Reserve as an issue. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's helpful for all of us. It means that we will be able to spend 100% of our attention and focus on really trying to discern what's happening in the economy. And I'll also say that uh, I think the president made a fine choice. Well, joining us now to talk about the markets is our markets editor, Christine Aquino. Christine, we also have a great chart. Thank you so much, first of all, for coming in. A very busy day when it comes to uh, Fed and actually repricing. And you can see the swap spread for June 22 actually now uh, more than 25 basis points. Were you surprised by the sudden repricing that it was actually happened very quickly yesterday in about an hour? Does it, is it more symptomatic of what the market are looking at than actual dovishness from Jay Powell? Yeah, I think that's correct, Francine. You know, we got the initial whispers of the debate between whether it was going to be Jay Powell, Lyle Brainyard uh, for the Fed chair position, and we, we saw an initial reaction from markets back then. And so it was a little surprising to see that markets reacted this strongly to it now that it was finally confirmed. And I think you're absolutely right in saying that I think this removes the uncertainty. That's, that's what Bostic was saying in the interview as well. This removes the uncertainty of what the Fed chair is going to be doing with monetary policy. I think it was, if it were Brainard, it might have been a little bit of a lag between uh, when she started and what they're going to do next with policy. But now that Powell is confirmed, he's firmly in place, then markets are pricing full steam ahead for the Fed tightening here. So that quarter point rise in June has been fully priced in. Maybe another one in September, maybe another in December. Where are we on, on tapering? The, the, the sound, the commentary, and we heard it there from Bostic around speeding up the taper. Is that going to happen in December? Well, it, we definitely heard from the Fed that they're going to start doing it. So that much, I think, is baked into the markets for sure. And I think that's why we are seeing the battleground moving from the tapering discussion to the rate hikes discussion. And I think it really is now a question of how much markets will push the Fed to do in 2022. We've seen the same situation happen here in the UK with the Bank of England rate hike bets. And so we're now seeing that happen in the Fed as well. Markets are flirting with the idea of a third Fed rate hike in 2022. And it'll be interesting to see if that that push and pull between markets and the Fed continues as we head into next year. Um, we want to talk about oil in a second, but is there really a danger, Christine, that the markets are getting ahead of themselves, a bit like the Bank of England, that they're too certain, and this is all in conditionality, we still have, you know, COVID that's resurging and certain parts of Europe are in lockdown again? Well, that's certainly the downside risk to all of this, right? But I think what markets are really reacting to right now it are still the inflationary pressures that we're seeing. We're seeing that coming through once more from the commodity sector, right? We're seeing a uh, a rise in oil, a rise in some of the key commodities like iron ore that's key to uh, producing materials and um, uh, industry, particularly in China. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is what markets are seeing at the moment, and this is what they're reacting to. But, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right, Francine, in that we are still uh, facing these downside risks, particularly uh, in Europe when we see the resumption of lockdowns and the possibility of more uh, coming in the winter. That's certainly something that could throw a spanner in the works if mm -hmm. we do see that coming and, and becoming more widespread. Switching back to the U.S., the U.S. 10-year currently at 161, the two-year at 61, a three-basis point increase on the yield there, following what we saw about three, four, 
four basis point increase yesterday, and that reflected in the tech stocks. Is that sell-off in terms of the NASDAQ and those very growth-heavy companies going to continue, do you think? Well, I think that is very much the fear, Tom, because when we're in this inflationary environment where yields are rising and the Fed and other major central banks are tightening, the, the initial kind of victims of that are definitely these high growth tech stocks, you know, and it's, we're not just talking about the fangs, right? Uh, we're, we're talking about some of these kind of more up and coming, really hot tech stocks at the moment that kind of get sw got swept up in that um, tech mania that we saw over the last couple of years. And so the question is, you know, will these companies that are perhaps you know less established in, in, with investors as um, the big tech companies, will they be able to withstand this new environment of tighter policy, higher yields, more inflation? Yeah. That's the big question that investors are asking and bracing for potential downside. Christine, the other big question, of course, what happens with oil? So we understand that India is said to plan some 5 million barrel of oil reserve release. Now, this is in tandem with the U.S. It's one of the first times that actually we see consumer, big consumer countries fight back and try to tame these prices of oil. We heard from OPEC Plus saying they'll fight back. So, I mean, is this going to be like a war of who controls the oil prices globally? Yeah, it seems like it's shaping up to be that way, isn't it? And I think how this plays out in markets is really more two-way risk, you know, when it comes to the price of oil, when it comes to the price of commodities in general. And so I think that's all going to feed into uh, the environment of uncertainty that we're facing at the moment, where there are all these kind of counter forces, right, in markets where inflation is really picking up, but then you have uh, central banks who are still a little bit hesitant to do too much about it too fast. And, and when you add in this dynamic of higher oil prices potentially or at least more volatility in the oil price and that just makes everyone's jobs more complicated. Christine, great as ever. Deep dive into the markets for us. Everything that's driving the price action. Christine Aquino, of course. Uh, we will get more in terms of the markets as well and the analysis from Aberdeen Investment Director James Athey. That is coming up uh, soon, that conversation. Yeah, and then at 9 a.m. UK time, we'll also be speaking with the Dutch Central Bank Governor and ECB Governing Council Member, Klaas Noord. It'll be interesting to get his Thoughts on inflation. We'll probably talk also about energy and COVID lockdowns across Europe. That's on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and this is Bloomberg. the supply chain are you starting to see things improve and if you are where specifically sir well this year we have been mostly affected by the semiconductor situation and uh, uh, we believe that the quarter three uh, was the quarter that was most effective people are talking about bloomberg surveillance there's some guy out on twitter who says i look like i'm on i know i know sir do you think I need a lift? Is it time what that I... What say about me? What did that particular gentleman what? say about... Let's have a look. Oh, one of them life. is near 101 years of age. Which one would that be? The other has an ego in the orbit of Mars. 
Who's that? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Mrs. Lisa, the only chance to productive conversation. It's a fairly accurate summary of this show, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> the eyes, or should I do the whole thing? Welcome back to the Open, everyone. 13 minutes into European trading day. A little bit of pressure across the board. We did see a big repricing yesterday after Jay Powell was reconfirmed for a second term. If you look at some of the differences out there in the markets, uh, look, the DAX is down a nine tenths of a percent, as is the CAC 40, and the FTSE 100 uh, is actually losing by a little bit less, 0 0.3. But then you also have repricing not only on treasuries, but also a couple of currencies. Uh, there was a move on Turkish dollar. Now, let's also check in on some of the stocks that are moving at the Open, our very own Lizzie Bird and has them for you. Lizzie, what's on your radar? Well, if we start with Seven Trent, the FTSE 100 water company, it's in the red so far at the open today. Uh, that's after it reported a net loss in the first half after a one-off deferred tax charge. But analysts say that with business returning, there could be still demand for water consumption and a boost as well from household consumption with people continuing to work from home at least some of the time. Another stock I'm watching is Julius Baer, the Swiss wealth manager. Uh, it had a tough day yesterday and then overnight we've had a note from Morgan Stanley uh, which downgraded the stock. It said it's going to need some transformative M&A activity to turn its uh, uh, fortunes around. Uh, that's after we had this boom last year with people consuming less, saving more, investing more and the surge in equity in house prices but now the slowdown in activity. And finally to UK house builders, again influenced by a note this time from Berenberg which has uh, upgraded the stock from hold to buy. That's because investors have been on tenterhooks for an interest rate rise from the Bank of England. Now they're saying that the house builders are looking cheap, set to outperform. I've got an eye on Barrett Developments and Bellway as well as up already in the green. OK, Lizzie, yes, all eyes, of course, on that BOE decision. We'll get into the details of that and get some commentary from James Athey shortly. Lizzie Gurdon, thank you very much indeed with the stocks to watch this morning. So the market action, let's bring it back to that then in terms of the macro picture as well with Aberdeen Investment Director James Athey. James, I love the punchiness of your note. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. The increased potential of a dovish policy error. Where is the policy error at a time when the labour market has not repaired, where growth is looking fragile and where COVID is back? Morning, Tom. Yeah, I mean, let's let's frame this slightly differently. Why is policy in exactly the same stance today as it was at the peak of one of the biggest economic shocks that we've we've seen in, in the last hundred years? Um, you know, it's, it's necessary to understand the stance of policy as well as think about policy in terms of changes. So, <clears throat> I think this is a problem that monetary policy has had for far too long. Is that um, the bar to uh, tightening policy has just been way higher than the bar to easing policy, and that's just led to this consistent ratcheting down of, of, of interest rates and cons consistent ratcheting up of, of broad stimulus you know, over 10 or 20 years with, with really no end in sight. And, and the, the deeper yeah. that these central banks dig themselves into this hole, the, the, you know, James. the more difficult the tightening becomes. James, I can't remember the last time you said anything nice about policymakers, but I mean, what we lived through the last two years was pretty unprecedented. I mean, I know it's not 08, but still, you kind of suspended the world economy and we were all stuck at home. So, it, you know, at what point is it that they can't normalize because of 08 and so they've stuck in this pattern or that they misunderstood the gravity of the pandemic and they thought it was actually more severe than it is? Yeah, I'm not necessarily sure it was about the gravity of, of the pandemic. I certainly think that understanding the relative importance of demand and supply shocks has been a huge problem. I mean, there's always a tendency to fight the last battle. You know, if we recall, the Fed said under its new framework that it would respond to realized outcomes. It would not be engaging in the forecasting game. And, and that was seen as dovish because in the past, certainly in the previous cycle, you know, the revisionist history is now that maybe it was a policy error to be tightening as aggressively in 2018 because it was all based on the idea that inflation would 
move above target given how tight the labor market was perceived to be. But we've got a very different problem now. But the, the, the Fed said it would resolve this issue of having tightened prematurely or overly aggressively last time by saying we'll just respond to realized outcomes. Well, the realized outcomes are highly inflationary, and yet there are still uh, excuses being made for why policy it shouldn't be tightened you know, immediately or shouldn't be tightened as rapidly. And so once again, once you lose any kind of anchor in terms of a, a policy reaction function, it becomes very difficult for everybody to understand why policy is where it is. And, and you've seen that in recent times mm. with, with some of these market gyrations. I think investors are really struggling to nail down exactly what it is that these central bankers are considering and how exactly they make these deliberations. Uh, James, I want to switch focus to the ECB briefly, but I want to bring in and up to date our viewers that the lines that are crossing in terms of the data out of France, manufacturing uh, and services PMI for the month of November, beating uh, the estimates. You've got 54.6 on manufacturing above the survey, 58.2 for services. James, when you look at the data out of Europe, when you look at the lockdowns in places like Austria and the restrictions around COVID-19, are you concerned about the trajectory of growth there and what it means for the dovishness of Christine Lagarde? I mean, much as Francine has, has, has sort of chastised me there for, for never being particularly positive <laughs> about policymakers, never. I'm really particularly positive about the Eurozone either. So, mm. yeah, I, obviously lockdowns are a concern. I, I have never been subscribed to the idea that the vaccine was going to be some magic shot for the world economy. I and mean, to me, that was always a, a hope rather than a, a rational expectation based on you know, analysis of, of, of humanity's experience with viruses. So. The vaccine hasn't unfortunately proven to be as effective as, as was hoped in terms of reducing transmission. And so I think it was somewhat inevitable that we had a resumption of, of a more widespread um, you know, transmission of the virus. Whether yeah. lockdowns are the right policy now, hey, I'm going to leave that for other people to talk about. But yeah, I do think that it obviously presents a risk to the growth outlook over, over the next few months. But again, what that means for inflation in the short and medium term is much, much more difficult to uh, to disentangle. James. The ECB will use any excuse to be yeah. dumbish. It has to. I would never chastise you on a Tuesday and via Zoom. We only do it on Wednesdays and in person in the studio. When you look, James, and some of the, you know, the things that actually worries the, the big bankers, so I had a conversation with the Goldman Sachs chief executive, and he says the problem in the markets is that you have a lot of people that are just used to making money because of this central bank dovishness. So do you worry about the reaction function of the markets when policymakers readjust, if they ever readjust, or is it more on the impact of the economy? No, definitely the markets. I, I, you know, I think we've we've allowed ourselves to really become overly sensitive to the idea of how, you know, effective monetary policy can be in in slowing the economy. You know, based on really relatively small changes from incredibly easy stances. Again, go back to 2018. It wasn't the U.S. economy which had a problem. It was it was financial markets, and there is a belief that that would transmit to the U.S. economy via the wealth channel or the confidence channel. But but realistically, I think what you see is that. You know, as you've just described there, speaking, I presume, about Mr. Solomon, the idea is that markets become addicted to stimulus and, and teddies get thrown out of the pram when the stimulus goes away and you get these massive vol events. I think it's even worse than just humans not having had the experience of a more inflationary environment or a, a tighter monetary policy environment. The market structure has shifted to become appropriate for the previous zeitgeist, this paradigm of low rates, low growth, you know, easy money forever. And that means that there are investor types and systematic investments and you know, algorithms and all of these relatively new features of financial markets, which ultimately just act as massive positive feedback loops. And that's why we see equity markets are just a momentum machine, because the structure of markets is such that it, it almost has to be that way. And I think it just means that if we do have a, a sort of shock coming from policy, I'm not sure markets are well yeah. equipped to deal with that. The breaking of that feedback, feedback loop and what it would mean for, for equity markets. Maybe that break comes next year. James Athey, Investment Director at Aberdeen, didn't even get onto his calls around the BOE, which he says is confusing themselves as much as they're confusing markets. He'll come back on. We'll get him on for that. In next the studio. Time. Absolutely. Okay, coming up, OPEC Plus warns it is considering adjusting alpha plans. That is, if the US and other nations proceed to tap their oil reserves. We're seeing India doing just that. We discuss that next. This is Bloomberg.
Reducing global warming continues to be an uphill battle in the fight against climate change. 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature deemed the safe limit for global warming set by the Paris Agreement in 2015. To limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, CO2 emissions would need to be reduced by 45% by 2030. 191 Paris Agreement signatories committed to setting national targets to reduce CO2. But current national targets project a 16% increase in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, with global temperatures expected to rise to 2.7 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. Among the most vulnerable to global warming are many of the world's smallest and poorest countries. I think all companies, individuals, and countries need to understand the impact of AI and what can and need to be done. And I give autonomous weapons as the most obvious example that countries need to look at. In crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. Will we get to herd immunity? Or let me ask it a different way. Have we given up on herd immunity as a practical matter? You will know when you get to that point, when the cases are so low, they're barely detectable. That's what herd immunity means. We don't know what that percentage is, David. <laughs> Welcome back to the Open. 25 minutes into the European trading day. There's a nervousness within these markets. There is selling across the European space. The stocks Europe 600 down 1.3%. You're seeing selling across the board. The FTSE 100 is the least bad performing market out there across Europe so far, down 6 tenths of a percent. You're down more than 1% there across France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Top of the list in terms of the sectors, the only sector that's in the green, basic resources, iron ore is up 4 to 5% so far today. Basic resources getting 6 tenths of a percent. Everything else is selling off Technology is at the bottom of this, down more than 2%. Okay, let's get the Bloomberg first word news now with Laura Wright. Laura. Thanks, Tom. Angela Merkel says the latest surge in COVID-19 infections is worse than anything Germany has experienced so far. The Chancellor is said to have told her party the situation is highly dramatic and warned that some hospitals would soon be overwhelmed unless the fourth wave of the pandemic is broken. Health Minister Jens Spahn says he isn't ruling out another lockdown. Probably by the end of winter, almost everyone in Germany, it might be cynical to say, will be either vaccinated, cured, or dead. But that really is the case. This is very possible with the extremely infectious Delta variant. More younger women are in work than ever in the UK, with the pandemic driving structural changes to the labour market. According to analysis by the Resolution Foundation, around 586,000 people have become economically inactive and no longer want to work since COVID hit in March last year. They say the increase in inactivity has been the most marked among older workers and younger men, with women benefiting the most from hybrid and remote working patterns. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Tom Francine. Laura, thank you. This is Bloomberg.
there's a pretty good chance that you use products made by Meta every single day. If you've never heard of Meta, that's because it's the new name for Facebook Inc., the parent company of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. All right, perfect. In a spiffy presentation on Thursday, Mark Zuckerberg showed off his vision for what he's dubbing the metaverse. That's a sort of mix of augmented and virtual reality worlds which will let the user explore virtual ecosystems. Much of what he showed isn't yet available. It's really his vision. In that sense, it was more like the sort of presentation Elon Musk does, where he looks at what he hopes might happen one day than what Steve Jobs does, which or Steve Jobs did, which is showing off products he already has available. He also, in the course of it, announced a name to, to Meta. The company will be called Meta from now on. Our mission remains the same. It's still about bringing people together. That's a, an effort partly to show the, the vision for the future, but also a way of casting adrift some of the toxicity associated with Facebook. But if this new company is going to be a success, or the new company vision is going to be a success, he will still have to deal with a lot of the same challenges that Facebook has faced. Concerns about privacy, content management, those are going to be just as pertinent, if not more so, in the metaverse as they are right now on Facebook's existing apps. isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan, we did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Welcome back to The Open, everyone. 30 minutes into the European trading day, and here are your top stories. Now, Powell picked again. President Biden sticks with the Fed chair and elevates Leo Brainard to vice chair. Treasury yields in the dollar slump, markets price in a full quarter point rate hike into a June Fed meeting and vaccinate and cured or dead. Germany's health minister issues a pretty stark warning for winter as Angela Merkel calls the latest COVID surge the worst ever. Now, Tom, we're also getting a little bit of a breaking news in the lira weakening past $12. This is on the back of a speech by Erdogan yesterday mm -hmm. where he basically abandoned the old policies and says, look, forget higher borrowing costs. What we want to focus on is investments. Yeah, and the lira is down about 60% year to date. You've had a number of rate cuts from the central bank over in Turkey, despite the fact you've got inflation at around 20%. So another record for the lira in terms of that leg low. We'll continue to watch that for us and the implications across the emerging market space. But you've got volatility across the FX space. If you look at the yen, the dollar, the euro as well, just bear that in mind as markets, as Francine has been pointing out, reprice on the back of the unwinding of some of these bets that maybe you get a more dovish personnel lineup at the Fed. That seems to be calculus, at least from some. And there's maybe a capitulation in these markets. We'll see how sustained it is. But you're seeing losses of 1.5% across the benchmark Europe stock 600. You're lower in Germany and in France by well over 1%. The UK and the FTSE 100 is the least bad performing. That's only because basic resources is holding up. That is a sector that remains in the green on the back of high iron ore prices linked to the China story. The FTSE 100 down 6 tenths of 8%. Let's switch it over and see how things are playing out sector by sector then as we weigh up these calls for a far a taper and a June hike, which being priced in, a quarter of a percentage hike in June being priced in by these markets and potentially flirting with the idea of rates hikes in September and December as well. Basic resources, as I said, the only sector that's gaining, six tenths, seven tenths of a percent. Iron ore is up again, a second day of gains on expectations that you're going to see a bit of curbing in terms of the restrictions on China property. Well, that means of steel demand and iron the ore that goes into that. Technology and financial services near the bottom. Technology is down almost 3%. The two-year is being up. The yields continue to rise, the two-year and the 10-year as well, comfortably above 1.6 in the session today. We had, of course, manufacturing and services PMI data out of France. That was a beat. And Fran, you've got economic data out of Germany. Yeah, and it's actually a little bit of a beat. So it's not a huge, but anything above 50 means an expansion. And actually, the German manufacturing PMI coming in at 57.6 instead of the 56.9 that we were expecting. Services also better at 53.4 instead of the 51.5 that we were expecting. So this really goes back to the general 
picture uh, that things are a little bit getting better. So we worry about inflation. Certainly that will be on the ECB's mind. That's our main question to Klaus Knot when we speak to him earlier on. But then we're also seeing PMIs and growth actually hold pretty strong with some pretty good figures across the board in the Eurozone today. Now, oil price is under pressure this morning ahead of a possible announcement by the U.S. about a coordinated release of crude reserves. Now, let's get more on the energy story with Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. First of all, Will, are we actually going to see a fight if we have this strategic reserve release with, you know, the U.S. and other countries, and will they be pitted against OPEC that wants to keep control of the price of oil? So first, we need to see what the details of the release are. We expect uh, Biden to speak this afternoon and perhaps to announce uh, when and how big the stockpile release uh, will be. We've already heard from India today. They're, they plan to announce the release today, and we expect that to be 5 million barrels. Now, that shows how modest some of these releases might be, because 5 million barrels is uh, slightly less than uh, India consumes in one day. So it's quite marginal figures. I think the impact is likely to be symbolic. You've got uh, China, Japan, uh, India, the US, and perhaps South Korea, uh, that includes the four largest oil consumers in the world, acting together. And that's clearly a challenge to OPEC. And what we have heard from OPEC sources yesterday is that it may persuade them to change their response. Why would they keep putting oil into the market if um, consumers are going to use their stockpiles? So you do seem to have this developing tussle between the oil consumers on one side and OPEC Plus on the other about who is going to uh, control the oil market in the next few months. Yeah, it's an intriguing tussle. You've got WTI and Brent both below $80 a barrel. Is there an optimal level that OPEC Plus is looking at? And what kind of response could we be considering from the cartel and allies? I don't know if OPEC is targeting a price. Obviously, they want higher prices than the US and China do. Uh, but uh, I think what they want is to be able to steadily increase production without pushing prices much lower than here. Um, they were scheduled to add 400,000 barrels a day next month, as they're doing every month uh, at the moment under their current deal. Under the deal, they do have the option to delay those increases by two months in response to market conditions. And I'm guessing that some OPEC ministers might see this stockpile release as a change in market conditions, allowing them to delay. And at the same time, of course, you've got a lot of uncertainty from the worsening coronavirus yep. outbreak in um, Europe. Thank you so much. Our Will Kennedy there, of course, in charge of all of our energy coverage. Now, Jay Powell keeping his job. Joe Biden nominated the Fed chair for another four-year term. The U.S. president also elevated Lil Brainard to vice chair, maintaining consistency as the central bank grapples with rising inflation and the economic impact of the pandemic. Well, Bloomberg guests have been weighing in on the nominations and its implications for Fed policy. This is a good team at uh, the Fed. This is sort of the dream team. I think this is a don't rock the boat move. There certainly is not going to be any conflict on monetary policy. This is the the central case that the markets expected. To not reappoint uh, Powell would have been quite negative for the markets. The announcement today is going to give the market more confidence to move ahead with the pricing of rate hikes for next year. It's not my expectation that we'll get a faster taper. We still have the Fed on wait and see. They stick with the current pace and then hike once you get to the to the end of that. We're at a point in the economy where stability is really important. Continuity. Total continuity. Continuity is a very good thing to have at the central bank, and that's what we're going to have. Well, joining us now is Silvia Delangelo, senior economist at Federated Hermes, and Simon Kennedy, our executive editor at Bloomberg Economics. So thank you both for joining us. Simon, let me kick off with you. When you look at you know, the, the dovish difference between actually Lel Brainard and Jay Powell, the market kept on telling us not that much. But then you see this huge repricing of the market. So what would they have been worried about if Brainard was in charge? Well, I think the feeling there was it, it, we're talking margins that uh, Lael Brainard is slightly more dovish in the market's view, although neither Powell nor Brainard have ever voted on monetary policy in, a, in an environment like this, so it would be hard to tell. Um, so it's probably a reaction to that, probably a reaction also to, to kind of getting through this period of a a flux at the atop the Federal Reserve. Uh, Joe Biden also saying yesterday that he's going to fill the other seats. He's going to look for diversity. He's quite clearly going to look for people on the employment side of the mandate, who favor the employment side of the mandate over the, uh, the inflation side. So you put it all together, you're probably going to get a more dovish Fed uh, in theory. But for the moment, uh, Jay Powell's back atop, and that probably clears the way for, for some thinking, some will think that uh, tighter monetary policy will follow. 
Okay, Sylvia, let's bring you in here. There's been a lot of discussion, and we've been hearing from officials within the Fed and outside of the Fed about the pace of the taper and whether they need to speed that up come December or maybe uh, later uh, or in the early parts of 2022. Is there a material economic impact? Does it matter if the taper is sped up? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say that from an economic point of view, uh, a slightly faster pace of tapering shouldn't really matter. But of course, it also depends on how markets react to it. And so if markets were to take it very uh, hawkishly and, and, and if financial conditions were to tighten significantly on the back of it, then of course, it would also matter for the economy down the line. Uh, so I'd say that it really depends on how market would interpret a faster pace of tapering. Yeah, how will they interpret it, Simon? I mean, this is a trillion dollar question. I'm really putting you on a spot for a Tuesday <laughs> morning at 8.38. But overall, I mean, we're not talking about temporary inflation anymore, but how long does this inflation last? I mean, you know, eight months, 10 months could be temporary. If, I knew, if, if I knew any of these answers, <laughs> I wouldn't be in journalism. Um, so let's talk about the tapering. Certainly, the, the, the Fed is, is, uh, is spooked by history. The idea that when, it, when Ben Bernanke set off that taper tantrum a few years ago, so it's been trying to hold the market's hand a lot more uh, clearly. But we saw last week, we started started to see kind of flares from the from within the Fed that uh, that the taper might uh, might accelerate that kind of leads to the groundwork perhaps not for December but early next year that uh, the Fed could perhaps pick up the pace uh, Larry Summers last night talking a, a much more aggressive uh, uh, game and uh, I'd be surprised if the Fed picked up on that and went as aggressively as uh, Larry Summers advocates. But certainly, you get the sense that uh, that monetary policy tightening will be a little faster. Or at least it's not really tightening; it's a slowing of stimulus. Uh, but the, the sooner they get through the taper, the sooner they can probably talk about rate hikes, much as they try to divide the two. Mm. Sylvia, where are we on the question of inflation? The framework for the Fed obviously poses the challenge. Uh, and, and we've been discussing that, Simon's mentioned this, around, around the growth, around inflation and then inflation targets, but also, of course, uh, the labour market and that growth, that broadness within the labour market. What is the stickiness of inflation and how that plays into the considerations for the Fed? So clearly, uh, the trade-off uh, for, for the Fed and for central banks in general between uh, growth uh, uh, is like threatened by a resurgence of the COVID pandemic and inflation, which has proven way uh, stickier and higher than expected, has intensified recently. Um, so I think that the narrative of you know, temporary inflation has been really challenged, uh, given that we've seen uh, high inflation for, for longer than expected, in the US in particular, uh, like measure that excludes the, the most volatile uh, components, uh, trimmed mean inflation, median CPI inflation, and also the Atlanta Fed sticky uh, price inflation. They've all, they've all picked up uh, recently. Uh, that said, I think it's still correct to say that inflation, high inflation, uh, is uh, really due to uh, pandemic-related distortions right now. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that we see some normalization, uh, after winter months, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, supply disruptions and uh, moderation in commodity prices, uh, then we should also see like um, a moderation in inflation yeah. uh, but in, Sylvia, after the winter months. But at the same time, I mean, I keep on hearing that a lot of, you know, politicians or, you know, world leaders are trying to change the supply chains so that they're a lot more secure. And I guess the question is, how much do these supply chains, have they already moved, um, you know, under the Trump administration? And how much can they still move? And if they move from, you know, the east to the west, do, do prices actually automatically stay more elevated? Uh, well, the problem is that it's not really uh, quick to uh, change supply uh, chains. Uh, so, of course, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, relocation um, yep. and, and, and shortening of supply chains. But as a matter of fact, in data, we have seen little evidence of that happening. Uh, and, and, and businesses are still benefiting from supply chains uh, that are uh, spread over several countries. And, and, and so it will be like a very slow process. Um, and, and that's also a reason why uh, these disruptions will well, have taken longer to really uh, sort out. Uh, Simon, in terms of the read across from, from the Fed uh, and how they weigh up these inflation pressures with what needs to be done on the jobs market and the read across to other central banks and the ECB, and we've been hearing from other officials, and they're voicing concern at least about inflationary risks. Isabel Schnabel was one of those. 
maybe not a big surprise given her German roots, but what is the read across to other central banks, to the ECB and the BOE? So I think you're seeing some divergence, to be honest. Mm. I think, and that's going to be a, a tale that goes into 2022. Isabel Schnabel this morning telling Bloomberg News about the, uh, the kind of elevated risks of inflation taking hold there. Uh, the People's Bank of, uh, of China um, being under some speculation that they're going to be going in an easing direction. So then you'd have the two biggest economies in the world going in different directions of policy. The Bank of England clearly trying to uh, um, kind of peel back some of the... Uh, uh, debate, but um, that we've had in recent uh, weeks, which had people hankering down for a, for a rate hike. There, maybe we'll still see one in December. So yes, there's certainly a, a case that the, uh, the the central banks all plunged into the recession together. They all uh, stimulated together. Uh, now they're going to follow different paths out. All right, Simon, yeah, huge congratulations, actually, to Carolyn Locke and uh, Alexander Weber for this wonderful, wonderful uh, exclusive interview with uh, Ms. Schnabel. Now, thank you also, Sylvia Delangelo, senior economist at Federated Hermes, and, of course, we'll get back to Simon Kennedy throughout the day. Now, coming up, curbs are tightening or tightened across Europe as governments battle surging virus cases. We assess the market impact next. This is Bloomberg. trillion dollars in spending not increase inflation by increasing the productive capacity of this country and uh, that's a very important thing that we frankly have not successfully done across most of my lifetime you know I've been waiting for this legislation for months since I became transportation secretary but various presidents have been hoping to reach this day for decades and it hasn't happened for all kinds of reasons the American public has been rightly impatient now we're getting it done both making up for lost time and laying a better foundation for the future let me also point out to the fact that part two of the president's agenda, what I like to call uh, the big deal. But part two of that, the, the Build Back Better Act, has even more that will help beat back inflation by lowering some of the costs that Americans feel most acutely, the cost of child care, the cost of health care, the cost of housing, the cost of prescription drugs, bringing those down while also making sure that we ease some of those labor market issues we have by making it easier for working parents to afford to go back to work. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility. So we have flicked the switch there and really uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. everyone and welcome back to the open we're about 46 minutes into the European trading day you can see pressure if you look at the various asset classes there is a lot of pressure with the Turkish lira actually the Turkish lira against the dollar at 12 the lowest ever uh, that is after the speech from uh, President Erdogan of Turkey but overall look the European stocks actually accelerating their decline overall down some 1.4 percent um, futures are dropping also in the US because there are more and more bets being priced into the markets of the Fed being dovish now, let's also take a look at the virus in Europe. Germany's health minister has issued a stark warning to those who remain unvaccinated. It comes as the country reported a record number of COVID cases in the fourth wave of the pandemic. Probably by the end of winter, almost everyone in Germany, it might be cynical to say, will be either vaccinated, cured, or dead. 
Well, Bloomberg's Maria today joins us now from Berlin. Maria, I have to say, listening to those words, it kind of sends, you know, shivers down the back spine because he was, you know, not pulling punches. The German government really upping the rhetoric on the severity of the fourth wave. Will this work in getting people to the vaccination centers? Yes, Francine, and, and in fact, I agree. You know, when I heard it, I had the same reaction. It's not every day that you hear from the health minister of a country say, by the end of the winter, let's come to terms with the idea that it's either you're vaccinated or you're facing dead. This is a kind of language that we haven't really heard until now from the German government. Now, a lot of this, as you say, has to do with the messaging. At times, very severe, very brutal, but the idea is that this is going to entice people to get this vaccine. If they feel there's real danger, the problem, Francine, is that you're dealing with with a group of people already who for months have said they don't believe in the vaccine, at times they don't believe in coronavirus, and also they believe that government should not have this say on a person's life. And if you look at the data from this week, it does paint you a picture of the challenges ahead for the German government. Most of the new vaccines this week are actually booster shots. They're not first-time vaccinations, and this is a real problem. This is a real gap for the German government, and so far they've not been able to close the gap, and perhaps that uh, gives you a response to the type of language that we're seeing that is very much in response to that. Maria, how resilient is the German economy to these pressures? Well, you know, uh, Tom, today we had uh, the PMIs that came out, but of course we know that this is very backwards-looking data. In fact, it paints a very different story. You know, it shows that the German services industry also manufacturing on a beat when you look at these numbers. But again, this reflects the past. It doesn't incorporate perhaps potentially the restrictions that we could see uh, coming in, particularly in regions like Bavaria and Saxony, where we know the infection rate has rocketed over the past few weeks. And in fact, today, again, the health minister is suggesting that vaccination boosters that may not be enough to bring down the infection cycle in those particular regions. So perhaps you do look at something that is a full lockdown that is regional, not nationwide, but something that looks like a lockdown on a regional basis. And by the way, uh, Tom, already we're seeing the Christmas markets, a lot of the service economy in Germany being shut because of the uh, infections and, and the pickup in the virus no. that we're seeing. Maria, thank you so much. Maria Tadeo there, of course, in Berlin with the very latest on some of these infections, but also the most important figure is how many people end up in hospital. Now, the Turkish lira actually tumbling to an all-time low on Tuesday. This is after President Erdogan last night actually defended his policy stance in his pursuit of lower interest rates uh, to boost economic growth and job creation, something that, if you study economics, is definitely counterintuitive. So you can see, actually, that crossing of the 12 line, uh, currently the lira weakening past $12 per dollar after that speech by President Erdogan. Uh, he basically said Turkey had abandoned old policy based on high borrowing costs and a strong currency in the name of slowing inflation. We'll have plenty more on Turkey and the Turkish lira shortly. This is Bloomberg. Five and a half thousand uh, forecourts, which is roughly 65% of all service stations in the UK. Um, of the ones that we were able to survey yesterday, roughly 1,500, 27% said they didn't have any fuel, 21% said that they had one fuel type or another, so that's either petrol or diesel, and 52% said that they uh, were fully stocked. Uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland seem to be okay. So we still are seeing, like your reporters are seeing, some stockouts at sites around London and the South East, I'm afraid. When do you feel confident that this will 100% be in the rearview mirror? Well, 
what we're hoping is those people that got fuel uh, over the last few days obviously don't need it um, uh, again for another few days, and that will give us a chance to actually start to restock the network. So we're trying to get it back to a reasonable level uh, to today and tomorrow, uh, and then over the coming weeks, because uh, it will take a number of weeks, uh, to get it back to the, uh, the sort of normal, more normal running levels. Friday with 30 minutes dedicated to fixed income. I'm Jonathan Ferro. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Welcome back to the Open. We are 53 minutes into the European trading day. Some pretty heavy selling across Europe. The stocks of Europe 600 down 1.5%. You're seeing losses at every single index and every single sector now in the red. Basic resources has also turned lower. At the bottom of the list, technology down by almost 3%. Some of this being blamed on modestly more hawkish commentary from ECB officials. And of course, we've had the repricing of assets stateside as markets start to look at a June rate hike and a faster Taper. We're also looking, of course, at the lira, Francine, tumbling to a record low, as Francine illustrated for us before the break, a day after President Erdogan defended his pursuit of lower interest rates to boost growth. The Turkish lira is now, this is eye-watering, 12.31. The move today has been incredible, but you're looking at a 65% drop versus the US dollar year to date. Joining us now for more is Zia Dawad from Bloomberg Economics. Ziad, just Remind us, what is going on with the policy stance out of Turkey and Mr. Erdogan and his insistence that rates need to be lower in an environment of very high inflation? Well, what's going on is basically a complete takeover, political takeover of the central bank. Um, markets don't like this. They're punishing the uh, Turkish lira as a result of that. And that's also happening in an environment where global interest rates in advanced economies in the U.S. Are, have, have had the potential to rise. So, you know, higher interest rates in advanced economies combined with uh, non-credible policy domestically has led to the sinking of the Turkish lira and the collapse of the Turkish lira this year. So, Ziad, first of all, a massive shout out also to our graphics um, and charts producer, Dan Curtis, who makes me smart on some of the technical things when it comes to Turkish lira. And if we bring that up for you, it basically is looking at the RSI divergence, which is really trying to test and probe. Um, it's, I think, currently at about 96. So what happens next, Ziad? Can, you know, is Erdogan looking at Bloomberg this morning, looking at the charts and OK with where the Turkish lira is going? Well, there are two scenarios of where, where we could go next. History suggests that when you have such a collapse in the lira and high inflation already threatening even higher inflation, that the central bank will buck at some point and increase interest rates aggressively to stem the decline in the lira. That's what happened in 2018. That's what happened in 2020. But the words of Mr. Erdogan has been he's been very you know clear about his intentions. He said uh, fallen color currency is good for the competitiveness of Turkey, is good for growth, is good for exports. He's saying inflation will not impact employment. And he's saying low interest rates are here to stay. And we have to take Mr. Erdogan's words at face value. He's been very transparent about what he wanted, even if it's counterintuitive and possibly wrong economically. Uh, but his, his guidance usually uh, gets materialized. And he's saying that mm. there's no floor on where the lira could go. Ziad, thank you so much for joining us. Ziad Dawood there for us, looking at Turkish lira and the leg forward. I mean, I call it leg forward. I mean, it's, it's actually, you know, incredible to, to have it touch 12. This is a support technical level and then going a little bit further. Now, coming up in the next hour, we'll be speaking with the Dutch Central Bank Governor. I'm looking forward to that interview. ECB Governing Council Member uh, Klaas Knot joins us for an exclusive conversation. This is Bloomberg.
the common ground on energy that you share now with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? We are both very committed to the transition to a net zero future and as part of that to building up the renewable energy capacity for Scotland and the UK. Scotland has got massive potential in wind energy in particular, onshore and offshore, but also some real potential in new and emerging technologies, carbon capture and storage, for example. Uh, there's also, uh, I think, an understanding, and perhaps the UK government and I don't entirely agree on the detail of this, but we must accelerate the move away from fossil fuels. We've got to do that carefully in a way that protects the people who are currently employed in that sector in Scotland, around 100,000 jobs, and do it in a way that doesn't right. see us importing more oil and gas, but instead moving to the alternatives. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. second term as chair of the Federal Reserve, and I'm, non, I'm, nom, I'm nominating Lael Brainerd to take the position as vice chair. Today, the economy is expanding at its fastest pace in many years, carrying the promise of a return to maximum employment. It means supporting a growing economy that includes everyone. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Powell picked again. President Biden sticks with the Fed chair for a second term and elevates Lael Brainard to number two. Biden's continuity call makes Fed hike bets intensify markets price in a full quarter point rate rise into the June meeting. And we discuss, of course, all of this, inflation expectations and pressures in our exclusive interview with the ECB's Klaus Knot. You can send in your questions on IB Plus. TV Go, but it'll be a good conversation, of course, on some of these COVID lockdowns and what we can expect on growth. We also had some PMI numbers today. Overall, a little bit better than expected, so maybe it adds a little bit of pressure, certainly on policymakers to do something when it comes to tapering. The European stocks, 600. You can see uh, down some 1.3 tenths of a percent. The focus there, not only on uh, the, you know, the, the inflationary bets actually spurring a lot of the central banks to do more, but the focus certainly across the board and what we heard in terms of the economic impact of renewed lockdowns. Then the other story is, of course, the price of oil, which we'll get to in a second. Um, oil very much in focus as we expect countries from India to the U.S. to possibly release some of their strategic reserves as soon as today. And then we we're just talking about Turkish lira, the weakest ever beyond 12, currently at 12, 2, 3, 7, 9. This is on the back of uh, President Erdogan giving a speech yesterday. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. You UK-based Atom Bank is moving to a four-day working week, one of the most dramatic flexible working policies introduced by a finance firm since the pandemic changed office norms. The fintech, which has 430 employees, says contractual working hours will be reduced by three and a half hours to 34 hours per week, with no change in salary. Now, the UK government is to temporarily take over the running of the gas and electricity supplier Bob as the energy crunch deepens. Regulator Ofgem will ensure uninterrupted supplies to Bulb's 1.7 million customers by appointing a special administrator with costs supported by the government. Soaring energy prices have caused 21 suppliers to collapse since August. 
and Samsung Electronics is reportedly planning to build a $17 billion chip-making plant in the Texas city of Taylor, about 30 miles from its existing factory in Austin. The new facility could create around 1,800 jobs, with chip output expected to start by the end of 2024. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel says there is an increasing threat of inflation taking hold. The central bank official reckons that the resurgent pandemic will not derail the recovery, while her remarks follow months of global investor concern at inflation and proceed euro area inflation due out the next week. Well, joining us now for an exclusive conversation on monetary policy, inflationary pressures and growth, I'm delighted to be joined by the Dutch central bank president. He is Klaas Knot. He's also a member of the ECB governing council. Knot holds the vice chair post at the Financial Stability Board, an international body that makes recommendations to regulators from December 2nd, he would also take over at the SF FSB's chair. So, Klaas Knut, welcome to Bloomberg. I immensely enjoy our conversations, and I couldn't be more delighted that you're joining today. Uh, first of all, Mr. Knut, when you look at inflation expectations, good morning. When you look at some of the COVID lockdowns that we're seeing in part of Europe, does it actually change what you're forecasting on inflation and on growth? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, of course, eh, there is still a lot of uncertainty about sort of the size and the stringency of uh, the lockdowns that will uh, await us. And when it comes to the impact, I would say that while uh, it will surely have a moderating impact on economic activity, the impact of, on inflation will actually be more ambiguous um, because it might also reinforce some of the concerns we have about around uh, supply bottlenecks, which at the end of the day is one of the primary drivers of the current bout of unexpected inflation that we are uh, going through. So in a way, uh, the, the impact on, on inflation is much more more uh, ambiguous. I don't think uh, myself that it will have an impact on our intention to wind down the uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. After all, uh, its dual objectives uh, have already been accomplished, both in terms of countering financial fragmentation as well as countering the damage that was done to the inflation outlook uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, if we look at today's inflation outlook, it's clearly more favorable than it was pre-corona in the sense that it is closer to our target than was the case pre-corona. But Ms. Knott, and I understand that at the moment it's quite difficult to see the you know impact on inflation given we also also don't know how long these lockdowns will will make and last. But does that mean that you you know do you feel as strongly as you have in previous remarks about the upside pressures of inflation or could these you know concerns also be tempered? No, I still feel as strongly about them. I, I, I should say that there is clearly elevated uncertainty when it comes to inflation and there are different scenarios uh, doing the rounds. Uh, if you look at uh, model-based uh, inflation projections, they still uh, uh, anticipate that inflation would fall back uh, below our 2% uh, objective in the medium term. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that these model-based projections have not served us particularly well during the uh, pandemic. They overestimated the initial impact, they underestimated the recovery, they underestimated the amount of uh, inflation that was associated with the recovery. And therefore, it's perhaps a little bit unsurprising that the market is actually pricing a different scenario where, yes, inflation will still come down. I mean, there is a, a consensus about that during 2022. But the market is pricing a scenario where the risks uh, in the medium term would be symmetrically centered around the 2% target. Well, if you have such an unusual gap, then uh, there is elevated uh, uncertainty. And I think that puts a premium on what I would call policy optionality, the fact that we shouldn't tie our hands for too long, but simply await the incoming inflation data and act uh, correspondingly. Uh, Mr. Knott, when you look at some of the market moves, do you worry that actually the market is too quick to react, that they fully price in things and then have to change quite quickly? Is it symptomatic of something that's happening in the markets? And how complicated is that for central banks? 
Well, we know that also uh, the market price pricing of inflation expectations has its uh, shortcomings. And one of the shortcomings is, of course, that it's very volatile and that it is responding uh, quite heftily to news, uh, etc. At the same time, uh, the market pricing of liftoff is, is consistent with its pricing of inflation. So if their view of inflation is right, then probably their view of the liftoff is, uh, is also right. Personally, I have said before, and I want to reiterate that, that I think uh, the conditions in our forward guidance for the liftoff will very unlikely be met in uh, 2022. I think the market has by now also understood that. Uh, it is pricing uh, the, the liftoff after 2022, and I think that is in line with our forward guidance. So what are you exactly expecting, or what does it mean for the ECB's decision in December? Well, in December, I think we have to come to an answer to the question, how far off our target are we really when it comes to uh, inflation? We all agree that inflation will come down. There are some objective factors uh, that will disappear from the inflation data after 12 months. So during 2022, we will see inflation coming down. The big question is, where will that trajectory take us? And there are different answers to that question. And that's why I believe... Uh, we should, uh, in the post-PEP world, first come to the question, how much monetary accommodation do we really, really need? Well, if you compare the post-PEP uh, inflation outlook to the pre-corona inflation outlook, it's clearly more favorable uh, than the pre-corona outlook. That, I think, is something uh, to take into, uh, into account. And that should also uh, be a measure for uh, the sort of recalibration of, uh, of asset purchases that we need to undertake in, uh, in uh, December. I would think that we need to come to an assessment on how far can we take our foot off the gas pedal mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. yet transferring our foot to the brake pedal. Right. I mean, does it make a difference, actually, what the drivers of inflation are for the ECB reaction function, whether it's supply chains and it comes down, or is it, you know, when it hits that 2% that actually something needs to be done? Well, it makes a difference to the extent that we always look at inflation over the medium term. And if supply shocks are short-lived, then, of course, we have to look through them. The question, however, is are the supply shocks that we're currently seeing, are they truly short-lived? They are transitory, but I would argue that they're not necessarily uh, short-lived. And by the same token, they still translate into a loss of purchasing power of the citizens that we serve. Um, Mr. Knot, I also want to ask you a little bit about, you know, is some of the ideas that have been floated around in how to address some of the, you know, risk of market fragmentation after pet purchases come to a halt. What's your preference in this? Well, I would say that, first of all, yeah, the homogeneity of monetary transmission is dear to our hearts, and that is true for the entire governing council. And I would also say that flexibility within the PEP has served us quite well uh, in this context. But the PEP as a program will not end in March. Only the net asset purchases will end. We will have a significant reinvestment challenge ahead of us, and we've already committed that we will reinvest at least until December 2023. And we will have to migrate that flexibility also to the reinvestment phase in order to prevent undue uh, fragmentation. And sequencing, and, and this, you know, you've reiterated a couple of times, sequencing is really important in the way that the market should be looking at this. Is the market doing a good job of interpreting the sequencing, or do you worry that sometimes it's a bit muddled up? No, I think we have been clear that uh, the sequencing will be that we uh, we are likely to terminate the net asset purchase phase of the PEP in March 2022. Then our next uh, instrument of marginal policy adjustment will be the APP. And as long as there is uh, inflation uncertainty around there, I think uh, that adjustment uh, should be possible uh, in either direction. And only after we have wound down also the APP will rate hike come into the equation. And I think the market understands that sequence of forward guidance uh, quite well. Uh, Mr. Knott, how does the governing council actually change with the stepping down of Mr. Weidmann of Germany? 
Well, we are guided by a mandate, and that mandate is price stability in the euro area. And that mandate, of course, is not dependent on uh, on individuals. Um, at this moment, uh, I don't know who is going to succeed, Mr. Whiteman. No one, no one really knows. I just can say that I look forward to work with her or him in the same fashion that I always worked uh, and enjoyed working with Mr. Whiteman. Uh, Mr. Knott, you also become chair of the FSB in a couple of weeks. So what will you focus on? Is it you know, climate change and disclosure, or how worried are you about LIBOR? Well, the, the work program of the FSB is quite wide-ranging. Uh, obviously, we have a tail of work coming from the corona. We worry a little bit about the impact uh, that monetary policy normalization in the advanced economies might have on uh, emerging markets. We have roadmaps being laid out for us on issues like climate risk, on digitalization of financial services, on making international payments. Uh, more effective. Uh, we have to also take up our work again on cyber risks. So it's a wide ranging uh, workload, I would say. And on top of that, of course, are the vulnerabilities that emanate from the low for long uh, interest rate environment. I, I mean, we've had, uh, Mr. Ignore, you know, a number of discussions with a lot of economists, and it's quite strange to see the difference in opinion from economists that are market participants about where we are in the economic cycle. Do you worry that actually, you know, we could be in a number of places just because of the unprecedented nature of what we're living through? Well, clearly, heterogeneity is an issue, and that is an issue across the globe when it comes to advanced versus emerging market economies. But it's even an issue within the euro area where you have countries like mine that are farther advanced in the cycle, and you have other countries that have not yet recovered uh, to the same uh, extent. That is why I have always publicly uh, endorsed and encouraged very much also the next generation EU recovery fund. And I think that's a, a, an appropriate instrument to also so deal with this type of, uh, of heterogeneity within the euro area. Mr. Knort, as always, thank you so much for speaking to Bloomberg. That was the Dutch Central Bank President and ECB Governing Council member, Klaas Knort. Now, coming up, Jay Powell picked again. President Biden sticks with the Fed chair and elevates little Brainard to vice chair. We have that story next. This is Bloomberg. when your shares are down 20 percent it's going to hurt but talk to us about well really what you're seeing what take us more forward looking are you worried about people exiting pandemic era and going back to the gym or, or are we going to work out at home more well that's actually um the advantage that Beachbody has is we have never been uh, a direct competitor with the gym. In fact, what we rely on is our ability to influence the 150 million people in North America specifically who are overweight or obese and haven't made that choice yet. Our job is to influence them with great content and this combination of what we call the total solution, fitness, nutrition, and community so that they can tap into this incredibly cost-effective solution that is entertaining and engaging right at home so that they get results. That's our job, is to help the new person engage in healthy lifestyles. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Jay Powell is keeping his job. Joe Biden nominates the Fed chair for another four-year term. The U.S. president also elevated Lael Brainard to vice chair, maintaining consistency as the central bank grapples with rising inflation and the lingering economic impact of the pandemic. Well, joining us now is Kamaksha Trivedi, co-head of global effects and interest rates at Goldman Sachs International. Kamaksha, as always, thank you for joining us. There was a pretty swift repricing in a short amount of time. I think in one hour or so, repricing of the dollar and some of the treasuries, the yield curve actually being repriced. Are, are markets right to be so quick to change their view on some of the established bets, or you know, are they getting ahead of themselves? Uh, thanks, Francine, for, for having me. So, look, I think that uh, it's clear that there was a perception that, uh, you know, a pick, a Brainard pick would be more dovish than, than a Powell pick. I think in the end, uh, I think these differences are somewhat overstated. Uh, and, and, you know, so you, you can understand the markets moving as they did. But I think there are some broader, um, you know, forces that are pushing the dollar, keeping the dollar on the front foot or pushing it higher over here. There's an active debate about, you know, when asset purchases end in the uh, in the U.S. You know, you had other Fed speakers talk about that as well, uh, compared to a kind of the pushback against a sort of premature tightening that, you know, you, we, we again heard from the ECB even, even, even on your program. And so I think that, that those underlying forces at the end of the day are more important. I think there's going to be a fair amount of consistency and continuity in policy, uh, obviously under, under Chair Powell, but I don't think at the end of the day it would have been that different uh, under a potential Chair Brainard. I know, Kamaksha, you've also put, you know, your macro outlook for 2022 with some top 10 market themes that we should be looking at. When you look at, you know, what we can expect from the Fed, is it sequencing that you're looking at or actually, you know, the amount of which they start normalizing? I think the market debate is very much about the pace of normalization. Obviously, you know, they have, you know, already started tapering. Uh, you know, there's some discussion about the appropriate pace of tapering. Uh, but, you know, having just started or just having, you know, decided on tapering and having just started that process, I think the bar for kind of shifting that pace very rapidly, I would think, is, is pretty high. So I think the market debate uh, is, is, is really around the pace of hikes, sort of when they get going. Our expectation for now is, is a couple of hikes uh, next year in 22, in sort of July and November. But it's probably fair to say that the risks to that are skewed to the upside. And that's really what the market is grappling with. That's, you know, partly what's keeping, uh, keeping the dollar on the front foot here. Um, Kamasha, and one of the actually in your top 10 market themes, it, you know, uh, made me smile the way that you put something up, up the escalator. So you're looking at central banks. And again, that's sequencing. Uh, you talk about the Fed, but then pricing the unthinkable is when does the ECB start normalizing and actually move away from negative rates? What will be the, the you know, the one that could provide either a taper tantrum of some kind of market shock? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, we've had a long period where, you know, rates have been very low, central banks have been extremely dovish, and this process of moving away from this sort of ultra-accommodative policy that has been placed, that has been placed, you know, pretty much across uh, across the, the, the world, uh, is always going to be a tough period for markets, always going to be a tough period for risky asset markets, especially when that comes against a backdrop where, you know, growth is still robust, we expect it to be robust mm -hmm. in the first half of next year, but slowing, the reopening boost from uh, from 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 you know the, the COVID restrictions is going to fade over the course of 2022. So it makes for a pretty challenging backdrop with the best part of the recovery behind us, some elevated valuations. We don't expect a taper tantrum as such. I think you know mm -hmm. central banks have been pretty careful about laying out the path, but it's going to be a challenging period mm -hmm. for 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 risky asset markets as some of this accommodation is withdrawn. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll get back to Kamasha Trivedi very, very shortly. In the meantime, we also look actually at what's happening with Turkish lira tumbling to a record low on Tuesday, a day after President Erdogan was actually defending his pursuit of lower interest rates to boost economic growth and job creation. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the lira. We'll have plenty more on emerging markets. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg.
put the garbage inside. There's a little sensor that detects the garbage and speaks out. Um, and this is one of the initiatives that we have created here. We as the residents of this neighborhood, a bunch of neighbors that have come together to try to deal with the fact that our neighborhood is dirty. We want to make a difference. We want to, to have a clean, clean streets that look nice and are nice to walk in. that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Early edition, a lot of the focus, of course, is on Turkish lira, falling to a record low against the dollar past 12, a day after President Erdogan defended his pursuit of lower interest rates. Now, the focus firmly on Turkish lira after we have this unconventional policy, which uh, President Erdogan really doubled down on. So this is uh, the picture as we speak. Once it touched uh, 12, it's now at 12.16. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on the Turkish lira with Kamakshia Traveda. He's from Goldman Sachs. will be really interesting to have a stake on what happens now and whether, um, as the president thinks, whether it's unconventional or not, it will spur inflation or whether actually it's a disaster waiting to happen. Now, coming up, we also talk about oil. OPEC Plus warns it's considering adjusting output plans if the U.S. and other nations proceed to tap their oil reserves. So we'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Esta operación definitiva para dar con la captura de este bandido la planeamos el 15 de, de octubre del año en curso. A las 8 de la noche en una guarnición de Bogotá nos reunimos con los oficiales de inteligencia de la policía. Nos reunimos con los oficiales de planeamiento de operaciones especiales de las fuerzas militares y de la policía nacional y es cuando se decide cambiar y darle otro salto a esta, esta estrategia.
A lot's happening on Wall Street. It's the basic law of economics. The Fed is telling us this is transitory. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. David, you just hit the nail right on the head. From business's most influential and instrumental. And that's the way you run good risk management. But we need to invest in our systems. Bloomberg Wall Street Week premieres Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. City. In London, in Sydney, in San Francisco. 9 a.m. in Beijing and Shanghai. Good morning, everyone. Have a great evening. So recap the headlines. You do not want to miss this How story. How are you thinking about those dynamics? I think that it's hard to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. Picked again, President Biden sticks with the Fed chair for a second term and elevates Lael Brainard to number two. Biden's continuity call makes Fed hike bets intensify, while markets price in a full quarter point rate rise into the June meeting. And OPEC Plus warns it may reconsider planned output increases if the U.S. and other nations tap their oil reserves, while India says it plans to sell 5 million barrels from its stockpile. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the focus firmly on a couple of things. First, it's uh, that dovish bet out of the Fed. Uh, we had some encouraging PMI figures overall in Europe, but still, it's inflationary pressures that are kind of the concern out there, and that Treasuries are dropping on the back of it. So global stocks falling to a three-week low. It's also dragging some of these U.S. indices' futures and Treasuries with them. Again, traders pruned bets for a dovish for longer Federal Reserve after the renomination of Jay Powell as its chair. The other couple of stories that we're watching out for is crude oil and the possible release of those strategic reserves. 78 to 99 is for Brent. And then Turkish lira past $12. And of course, it's uh, the most, uh, well, the weakest lira that we've seen in quite a long time. And you can see it's continuing to weaken. Now let's bring back Kamaksha Trevedi, co-head of global effects interest rates at Goldman Sachs International. Kamaksha, thank you so much for sticking around. I mean, what happens to Turkish lira at this point? Look, I think uh, you want to stay firmly cautious on the lira. I think this policy mix is unsustainable. Uh, this is a country with very high inflation. You know, interest rates need to be going up, not coming down, in our view. Uh, and the world is different as well. As we have been talking, uh, you know, global monetary policy rates are moving higher. Uh, yes, oil prices have had a bit of a pullback, but those have also been on an upward trend. And in that sort of context, it's really questionable, you know, how long this... Uh, uh, this policy of easing easing rates in Turkey can continue in the face of such high uh, such high domestic inflation. So the policy mix is unsustainable. It probably sows the seeds of its own end, but it can end in ways that are either investor friendly or investor unfriendly. So so we would remain pretty cautious here. So uh, Kamaksha, how does it? I mean, if it's actually investor friendly, how does it end? And when's a good time to enter back into the country? I mean, look, I think, you know, e even in Turkey, we have seen, uh, you know, windows where, you know, policy mix shift shifts back to a more orthodox stance uh, and, you know, it, right. real rates are moved back higher again. At the current juncture, there's no indication that any anything like that is 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 likely to happen. If there was a credible shift in that direction, uh, I think then one can you know this is clearly a currency that is you know cheap on many conventional metrics. It's a uh, it's it it has you know it yields you know very 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 highly, and so I think you could see investors come back there. But I think that the, the constant erosion of credibility, uh, I think, is beginning to take a take a toll on the in, in the willingness of investors to engage here, even if there is that shift. So I think, we, you know, the bar is just higher. Yeah. Kamaksha, overall, how, many, you know, how, how much interest will there be in emerging markets? I know amongst your top 10 themes for 2022, and you also mentioned China and its tolerance to have lower growth. Does that reprice world growth or where, actually, for example, we're importing inflation from? It's a great question, right? I mean, I look, I think, you know, globally, I think it's going to be a tough environment for emerging markets. I think it, it already has been, but in some sense, you know, 
growth is slowing, policy is tightening. China, as you mentioned, has moved to a lower gear of growth. Uh, you know, and we're seeing the reemergence of some of the old school emerging market challenges, inflation, political instability, uh, you know, some of those, those things, fiscal overreach, uh, you know, and, you know, that's going to make it a challenging environment for EM assets to do well. Uh, I do think on China specifically, however, I think perhaps on the market standpoint, there may be an interesting asymmetry. Yes, it's been a tough year. Yes, we expect growth to slow. But if we get some degree of policy stability and policy clarity in the objective function, uh, I think you know investors may be surprised on the upside there, and I think there will be willingness to sort of take that risk. But I think you know coming back to you know some of the challenges that I was mentioning, and you know Turkey is sort of exhibit yeah. A of some of them. I think there is going to be a higher bar to get investors engaged again. Um, uh, Commissioner, we're also just getting some live pictures there of President Erdogan giving a speech. I imagine it's the parliament. Uh, certainly it's a full house in a pretty grandiose setting over in Ankara. So we'll see whether uh, that weakens the Turkish lira further. But Kamaksha, where do you see the most interesting bits? We're, we're going to speak to, of course, our Will Kennedy on oil in a second. There was also a couple of assets repricing in Russia. This is on the back of that intelligence report about foreign policy. Will it be driven by foreign policy, some of these emerging markets, or how much volatility could we see in some of them? Volatilities and emerging markets, you know, always come together. So in that sense, there's no, there's no, there's no change there. I mean, we are pretty constructive on oil prices overall, and I think the most, the, the, the key point there is that, you know, apart from what happens to spot oil prices because of some of these news on, on releases, and some of that might already be priced into the oil price fall that you've seen over the last, uh, you know, week or so. I think it's really the longer dated oil prices where we are more constructive, and what we have found in our research is that macro assets price much more of those longer dated oil prices. And so if you actually do see oil prices move up, not just on a spot basis, but further along the curve, that's the kind of thing that should allow oily currencies, oil exports, credits, and so on to start uh, moving higher. So there's, you know, there's definitely opportunities uh, within, within the emerging market space, but the volatility comes with it and a challenging backdrop uh, is, is, is what comes with it as well. Kamaksha, thank you so much. Kamaksha Trevetti there from Goldman Sachs International with some great calls and, of course, looking forward to the themes of 2022. Now, oil prices under pressure this morning following an announcement from India that they plan to sell 5 million barrels from its strategic reserves with more likely to come. Now, the move comes ahead of a possible announcement by the U.S. about a coordinated release of crude reserves along with Japan and South Korea. Well, joining us to discuss all of this is our Bloomberg Energy and Commodities editor. He's Will Kennedy. First of all, Will, when are we likely to hear, if it happens, some, you know, the, the release of these strategic reserves, we wouldn't have seen anything like it actually for quite some time. No, the last time there was any sort of coordinated uh, reserves was during the Libyan civil war in 2011. So this is an unusual event, and it's more unusual because it involves China, who haven't been part of those efforts in the past. Uh, we expect to hear from Joe Biden at 2 o'clock. He's speaking on uh, the economy and efforts to lower prices. We assume that's when he may announce the action. Um, we've already heard from uh, officials in India that they're going to take part and re uh, release 5 million barrels a day. Not a day, sorry, 5 million barrels. Uh, that's a pretty modest actual release. It's less than India consumes every day. So if that's repeated on the sort of similar proportional scales in other countries, we're not looking at a huge stockpile release. Um, but I think it's significant lies in the fact that you've got uh, four, the world's four largest oil consumers working in concert. Okay, so what, first of all, what does that mean concretely for the, the price of oil? I know, you know, the devil's in the detail. It depends on how much they yeah. release. But we've kind of heard fighting talk then from OPEC+. Plus. Yeah, I do think that a lot of this is probably priced in already. This has been talked about for a number of weeks. The market has clearly been anticipating it. And I think it's one reason why prices have remained fairly subdued uh, since the start of the month when OPEC rebuffed calls from President Biden and other to increase production faster. Now, the market's going to be potentially is going to be back on OPEC+. Plus. They meet on December 2nd. They had been expected to add another 400,000 barrels a day. That's their plan, those monthly increases of 400. We heard from several officials yesterday, though, that action by the US and others means they may have to recalibrate, that their argument is if that consuming countries are going to do this, they may need to think about how quickly they're going to put oil back into the market or risk upsetting prices. 
All right, Will, thank you so much. Will Kennedy, uh, it will not be a dull day for Will and his team either today or the week as we await the release of some of these strategic reserves. Now, the UK government is temporarily also uh, taking over the running of gas and electricity supplier Bulb as the energy crunch claims another victim. Now, the move represents the first forced nationalization in the UK since the 2008 banking crisis, and it's the first time the special measure has been used in the energy sector. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison. Rachel, tell us about this pretty, you know, bold and unprecedented move from the government. What's the thinking behind this? And could it have survived in private hands? But the answer is probably no. That's right. The government and the regulator Ofgem decided that it wasn't going to be possible to find a deal for Bulb to give the customers to any other supplier. So they have bulb has put themselves into this special administration process. So soon an administrator will be appointed and will take on the running of the company. They will be backed by treasury funds, which will then later on be passed on to consumers via bills. So even though the government is backing this administration, the costs still get passed to consumers. And it's quite unusual. As you mentioned, it's never been done in the energy sector before. The government says it has been used in other sectors. But mm. it's because Bulb is so big, they have 1.7 million customers. That's much bigger than the other suppliers we've seen who have failed up to now. And that's why the government's taken this quite extreme measure to try to calm any chaos that may ensue from the collapse of the company. Um, Rachel, how's the wider energy sector actually holding up in general? And Bob was, you know, the, the 21st supplier to go down since August. It's pretty incredible, actually, putting it into context like that. It is, yes. We have now got over 3 million households that have been forced to switch supplier. And some energy suppliers are saying that they expect more to follow. So this was really the big one that everybody was waiting to see what would happen with. And it's a lot of customers to for another company to take on. So we don't know what's going to happen next, how long the government will essentially prop up this administrator to run the, the company or how they will deal with the customers in future. We think they will probably sell or give the customers to other suppliers because the government can't run an energy company forever. Um, but when that will happen, we don't know. A big factor seems to be the cost for consumers and the timing of that. Mm. The government doesn't want to put too much pressure on households at a time when inflation and everything else that um, we've talked about in the past are really hitting households. Rachel, thank you so much. Rachel Morrison there from Bloomberg News. Now, in the meantime, we're getting live pictures out of Ankara, where we're listening or hearing shortly from President Erdogan. He's just giving a speech as the lira is hitting a low versus the U.S. dollar. In fact, the Turkish lira are tumbling to a record low on Tuesday. Um, the currency breached, well, past 12 per dollar, which is really a psychological important level. And this is after President Erdogan yesterday defended his pursuit of lower interest rates to boost economic growth and job creation. We'll have plenty more on Turkish Lira shortly. This is Bloomberg. thinking about formerly incarcerated people as representative of their families also and of their communities. These are human beings. They're not disposable items. They are not to be warehoused, locked away, out of sight, out of mind. And so I'm out here in the public because I am the conscious of those folks who, of America, I hope, I'm hoping to prick their conscience and know that I am just a symbol of a much greater problem. People are talking about Bloomberg surveillance. 
There's some guy out on Twitter who says, I look like I'm on. I know, I know it's that. Do you think I need a lift? Is it time that I... What did they say about me? What did that particular gentleman what? say about... Let's have a look. Oh, One of them Lord. is near 101 years of age. Which one would that be? The other has an ego in the orbit of Mars. <laughs> Who's that? I had no idea. <laughs> Mrs. Lisa, the only chance to productive conversation. It's a fairly accurate summary of this show, isn't it, Tom? The eyes, or should I do the whole thing? Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's focus on sustainable investing. Mirova is an asset manager affiliated with Natixis. It specializes in sustainable investing with a number of funds and 25.9 billion euros in assets under management. Now in September, they launched their first impact private equity fund. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this, some of the key issues in sustainable investing and where we go after COP26 is Mirova chief executive. He's Philippe Zawati. Philippe, thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Surveillance early edition until some of the you know disclosure when it comes to green is mandatory how much more progress will we do from where we are in December or November 2021 I mean uh, the, the, the fact is that we uh, we have a very very strong trend in terms of, of, of regulation uh, as you know and uh, and more and more we, uh, we we get a lot of data from from companies and and all this is is going uh, to be uh, more and more compulsory, more and more structured. So uh, we had a couple of uh, very interesting announce announcements at, uh, at the COP26, and especially uh, everything which is uh, around what uh, the, the concept of uh, net zero. Uh, and uh, and we uh, we have all, all this concept, uh, which is uh, uh, now, uh, uh, I mean, taken by a lot of corporates, but also a lot of uh, investors. And, and, and today, this is a little bit difficult to sometimes to understand what net zero means uh, in, in this context. So uh, this is probably one of the, of the big questions we have ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. It's difficult to understand. And it's also, Mr. Zwati, very difficult to see who will put pressure on chief executive to make sure they stick by it. So do, do you still worry or where do you worry about greenwashing? Some of the you know sustainable products have also had to be relabeled in Europe. Do you expect that move to take place around the world? Greenwashing is, is, is of course a, a big issue, and uh, uh, and I mean the pressure will come from different di different areas, different steps. I mean the regulation is clearly one, uh, and and especially the one of the, in the European Union is uh, is going more more and more uh, important, especially with the uh, new uh, di directives which uh, have been uh, uh, I mean set up uh, the last uh, couple of months, especially the SFDR directive, which uh, now uh, make it compulsory for all the fund managers to explain the, uh, very concretely how they integrate ESG and to uh, classify their funds in different categories, Article 6, Article 8, Article 9. I mean, I won't, mm -hmm. I won't go into to the details, but I mean, there are more and more pressure on this. But 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 it, still, uh, all these concepts are very complex. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, when when, I, when it's come from for, uh, about net zero, for example, I mean, net zero is something very uh, easy to understand at the global level, at the, at, at the, the planet level. It's it's a little bit difficult to understand at, at a country level, but still, we, we can understand what it means. But at the company level and for an investor, it's more and more difficult. And and uh, and also uh, the fact that it's a very long term horizon net zero by, by 2040, 2050. So we have to clarify much more uh, what is it about. And this is the reason why the, the, the yeah. initiative which was taken by Mark Carney at, at, at the COP uh, was very interesting. I mean, the, the, the Glasgow uh, uh, initiative for net zero, which gathers the insurance, banking and insurance and asset management uh, uh, net zero initiative uh, is something uh, very, very, very bold, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is bold. At the same time, we've spoken to a number of big banking executives that, you know, have have signed this Mark Carney initiative, G fans, but at the same time say, look, the transition will take time, and so they will continue to finance fossil fuel projects. So, Mr. Zawati, first of all, how do you marry these two, uh, I guess, things that, you know, don't seem to go hand in hand from a philosophical point of view? And at the end of the day, how do you also incentivize or punish other companies that don't sign up to this, you know, climate goal? That's 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 a, a big question, uh, and especially the, the the financing of of fossil fuels. This is also the reason why we are uh, we are clearly in favor of the 
uh, continuation of what has been done by the European Commission. Uh, so now we have, as you know, a green taxonomy, which uh, clearly explain what is green, what is green investing. Uh, and we also need uh, the other part of this, which uh, could be the, a broad taxonomy, defining exactly uh, where we should, should not invest or we would, we would stop to invest. Uh, and, and so this is an ongoing discussion at, at the Euro, uh, European Union level. Uh, so we are pushing a, lo a, a lot uh, on, on this. It could be a, a very interesting tool in order to incentive uh, all the investors and banks to stop financing uh, fossil fuels. Uh, it would take time because uh, the economy today is uh, 80 percent. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, led by by by, by fossil fuels. So uh, when you're a bank, when you're a global investor, it's very di uh, very difficult to move away from all all, all this uh, current economy. Uh, but if we uh, get some uh, tools, I mean, uh, especially defense on one hand, so the, the industry-led initiative on one hand, and regulation with broad taxonomy on the other hand, then I think we could we could move forward. Uh, Monsieur Zawati, what do you need from policy and actually from public officials in the next six months to make sure that we really drive investments in sustainability and maybe not only on climate change, but also the, S the G and ESG? Uh, I mean, there, there, we, we, we need uh, the, uh, the, the, the policy to, to continue to, to push. I mean, the, uh, you, as you know, there, there will be the, the uh, presidency, the, the, the France will be, uh, will take the presidency of the European Union uh, from January the 1st. Uh, so uh, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity also to, to push on this. There is a very strong debate also uh, around uh, um, company reporting and uh, accounting. Uh, with the announcement which has been made by the uh, the IFRS Foundation uh, to create the uh, EISSB, uh, uh, International Sustainability Standard Board, which with the objective to set some uh, global standards for uh, um, non-financial uh, reporting from companies. But there is still a very strong debate between the European mm. view on this and the American view on this. And especially the fact that at the European level, we are pushing what we call the double materiality. That means not only the impact of nature and climate on companies, but also the impact of companies on nature and climate. And this is very, very, very important and, uh, and a strong debate that, uh, that will, I mean, yeah. lead the discussion in, in, in coming, coming months. Mr. Zawati, as always, thanks so much for joining us, uh, the Morova Chief Executive, Philippe Zawati. Now, coming up, life after LIBOR is bad over tax-related language is holding up U.S. legislation designed to prevent chaos when LIBOR gets phased out. So we have a full roundup of life after LIBOR shortly. This is Bloomberg. is going to look like? Do you think there is going to be a price war? As you say, the fares are available now. You're suggesting they may not be there for, for forever. But nevertheless, talk to me about what you think the competitive landscape is going to look like here. We've seen a bit of departures in this market, and this market has three very strong joint ventures that compete head-to-head -head daily uh, to win the hearts and minds of consumers and businesses in the United Kingdom. So I, I don't see a difference in, um, in the competition. I think we've all focused on Heathrow as the major hub in the United Kingdom, connecting, of course, the U.S., uh, New York, Los Angeles, and other locations. So I see this as a continuation of competition. We've been waiting for the day that we can compete strongly in the marketplace uh, after such a long period of time where it's only been one directional traffic from the U.S. Yep. to the U.K., and now it's open, of course, to U.K. Uh, you, nationals. You mentioned Heathrow. What about Gatwick? We made a very tough decision in uh, March of last year to really focus our efforts 
at, at Heathrow. I think all companies, individuals, and countries need to understand the impact of AI and what can and need to be done. And I give autonomous weapons as the most obvious example that countries need to look at. It's a really a reminder, isn't it, just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the UN. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, a spat over tax-related language is holding up key legislation in the U.S. Congress. It's designed to protect trillions of dollars of assets from chaos when global regulators phase out the interest rate benchmark LIBOR. Now, well, joining us now is Bloomberg's editor of FX and Rates, Will Shaw. He's also a bit of an expert when it comes to LIBOR. So, Will, um, this concerns some $16 trillion, of course, of assets tied to LIBOR, and it's down over a fight at the IRS. Tax system. So, what exactly is the issue here? Um, just so, thank you very much, Fran. So, quickly, by way of background, the Structured Finance Association say there are all these contracts like student loans, business loans, mortgages that can't transition unless there's federal legislation. Now, a solution is underway in the House, but it's met a roadblock over the thorny issue of tax. Now, the draft legislation in its current format would prevent the IRS from recalculating financial firms' tax liabilities mm -hmm. at the moment that their contracts transition. Now, as you can imagine, that is music to the ears of some banks because mm -hmm. it means they'll be protected from extra tax. Um, but there's been a pushback from powerful lawmakers in the, the Congressional Ways and Means yep. Committee. Now, they say the Treasury should be left with the discretion right. to regulate and prevent, pr protect against tax avoidance. So, Will, how does this play out? Uh, nobody knows yet. So it's being, this bill's being sponsored by a congressman called Brad Sherman, who's a Democrat. Um, he says he's willing to compromise on this issue, but at the same time, he's not optimistic that this will, this will pass soon. All right, in terms of timeline, I mean, could it be soon as in like three months, six months? Could it, could it take longer? I wouldn't bet any money on this <laughs> happening immediately. Um, yeah. Also, we've got until mid-2023, so there is a certain amount of time, but the Structured Finance Association um, is warning that um, without, this, without this legislation, there's a serious risk of financial disruption. Thank you so much, our Will Shaw there, a Bloomberg FX editor, and well, for FX and rates, and of course, a little bit of an expert when it comes to LIBOR. Now, the Bloomberg short term bank yield index, also an alternative to so for, uh, for dollar LIBOR, is administered by a subsidiary of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News. So that's a disclaimer from us. We also look at uh, Ankara, where President Erdogan giving a live speech after um, Turkish dollar touched 12. This is a huge psychological level. It also means that the leader are weakened to its lowest point ever. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour.
21 years ago, uh, you and Dixon was the first guy to, to do it. It's taken a century for us to change our propulsion system away from liquid fuels. There are dozens of international companies in that airframe size who have realized the opportunity, are in a, an, an, in a race to get those commercial aircraft out there at that scale. It's a, an area that can be served by hydrogen, which we're well placed with through fuel cells. I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad. That we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. Friday with 30 minutes dedicated to fixed income. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. What I think we're all mainly worried about is a Fed policy mistake. And the market is looking at the likelihood that the Fed will increase the rate of tapering and move up the timing of the first rate hike now that Powell has been renominated. I think there are good arguments to be made that we really should be considering how fast we execute the taper. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, November the 23rd. Our top stories today. Joe Biden plays it safe. The president avoids a Senate confirmation fight by nominating Jerome Powell for a second term as chair of the Federal Reserve. The big oil consumers take on OPEC. The U.S. and several other countries are preparing to tap their strategic reserves to try to bring down the price of crude. And nothing is off the table in Germany. The government's not ruling out any measures, including another lockdown, as it battles a deadly new wave of coronavirus. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie here in London and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. And Kayleigh, the market spent the last uh, 20 hours or so, I suppose, adjusting to the new information around the Fed, around Chair Powell, and factoring in tighter uh, financial conditions to some extent in the United States, but also developing a, a European dimension to that narrative, and that is weighing on European stocks this morning. Yeah, and it's weighing really on stocks across the board, Anna. The market seems to have taken this decision as a hawkish one, leading it to price in the first Fed rate hike in actually June. That led to stocks lower, yields higher in the U.S. yesterday, and that really followed through into the Asian session overnight. Your big underperformance coming from Hong Kong, specifically tech stocks. The Hang Seng Tech Index down about 1.4%. Some of the biggest tech drags were the likes of Tencent and Alibaba. Tencent and Alibaba actually each down more than 2%. Alibaba about three full percentage points, approaching a record low. Part of that is regulatory concern in China, but a large part of that also could just be following U.S. tech lower with those higher yields. Japanese equity markets were closed today, but the yen is trading. Really interesting story. At one point, it crossed dollar yen crossed 115 as you saw that stronger dollar off the back of the tapping of Jerome Powell for a second term. That has reversed some now, though. The yen actually stronger against this U.S. dollar by about a tenth of a percent at 114.76. And then iron ore continuing its rebound up about 14 percent in the last three days futures up 4% uh, in the overnight session because there is some speculation that steel output could actually increase next month. 
As for the picture here in the U.S., similar story to yesterday, though futures are off of session lows. The S&P 500 E-mini is only down less than a tenth of a percent right now, but NASDAQ 100 futures once again are lagging. You are still seeing yields moving up. We're up about a basis point on the 10-year to 163, but you're seeing more movement at the shorter end of the curve. Again, that repricing of rate hike expectations. So as a result, your 530 spread once again is at its uh, narrowest since March of last year. Quick check on Bitcoin, a little bit of a rebound, but not much, up about two tenths of one percent. We're above fifty-six thousand dollars, Tom. Kaylee, you rightly pointed out the sell-off that we've seen in tech globally. The U.S., of course, started this, then China, now Europe. The top sell-off in terms of the sectors is coming from the tech sector. Financials are also down. It's red across the board. Brief and broad selling is what you're seeing at the moment. Down two tenths of a percent here in the U.K., despite the fact that basic resources are up on the back of higher iron ore prices. The Cacahont in France is lower by seven tenths. The DAX in Germany lower by one percent. Investors looking past more positive data in terms of manufacturing and services from France, Germany, and the U.K., and focusing as Anna was saying on some commentary from officials to suggest that the change in terms of the adapting stimulus picture here in Europe is not going to be thrown off by what we're seeing in terms of lockdowns across the continent. In terms of how things are breaking down sector by sector in terms of the assets, let's take a look. Across the Europe stocks is under then, that's the benchmark down 1%. The euro dollar is in focus because it's been under pressure. It's at lows not seen since about June or July of last year, but it is gaining now two tenths of a percent. That is probably tied to the slightly more hawkish, modestly more hawkish commentary we're getting some, from some officials uh, within the ECB. The Turkish lira breaking another record, now above 12. This is the first time we've seen that, and that is despite the fact, and in fact, because we've heard from President Erdogan reiterating in Turkey that he wants to see low rates. We've had three cuts since June, despite the fact that inflation is running at close to 20%. So further gains for the dollar versus uh, the Turkish lira. In terms of the oil space, you touched on this, of course, pressure there down more than 1.5% as we look at that tug of war between OPEC plus and the US administration plus others in terms of that demand for oil. We'll get more on the oil markets in just a moment. And worth noting that Erdogan, President Erdogan's views on the rates environment in Turkey really do matter. And we're hearing from the Turkish president. Uh, he's ruling out the possibility of an early election. So uh, just uh, emphasizing why they, why they matter so much. Now a look at what is ahead for us today. President Joe Biden is said to be preparing to announce a release of oil from the nation's strategic petroleum reserves. The move would be an unprecedented effort by major oil consumers to tame prices. Who will go with him? then India, Japan, China, all in the mix. Biden will also give a speech on the economy and combating inflation at 2 p.m. at New York time. This as markets digest his latest decision on the next Fed chair. Plus, we'll get November PMI data for the United States at 9.45 a.m. at New York time. As Tom said, a lot of that data has been good coming out of Europe, but it hasn't really affected market sentiments. Manufacturing, or manufacturers, sorry, are facing rising costs, as we know, and those in turn are being passed on to consumers, something that no doubt Jerome Powell will dwell on. Kaylee. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he has a tough job ahead for sure, Anna. And speaking of Jerome Powell, of course, he is keeping his job. President Biden nominated him for the Fed chair for another four-year term and elevated Lael Brainerd to vice chair. That maintains consistency as the central bank grapples with rising inflation that Anna was talking about and the lingering economic impact of the pandemic. When our country was hemorrhaging jobs last year and there was panic in our financial markets, Jay's steady and decisive leadership helped to stabilize markets and put our economy on track to a robust recovery. American resilience, along with strong policy actions and vaccines that enabled the economy's reopening, cushioned the blows and set the stage for a strong recovery. Today, the economy is expanding at its fastest pace in many years, carrying the promise of a return to maximum employment. I'm deeply honored that you're entrusting me with this responsibility at a critical time. I'm committed to putting working Americans at the center of my work at the Federal Reserve. This means getting inflation down at a time when people are focused on their jobs and how far their paychecks will go. Now, President Biden's picks may help him avoid a contentious Senate confirmation battle. Jo Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now from our D.C. Bureau. So, Joe, maybe less contentious than it could have been. Is there any real yeah. doubt that Powell and Brainerd will get confirmed? No, not really at this point. That was kind of the hard part yesterday, which wasn't very hard for really two very non-controversial picks. Most lawmakers over the weekend saw this coming, and in many cases, they were hoping for it. Now, that's not to be confused with some of the other seats that the president 
likely has yet to fill. Brian Deese, the president's chief economic advisor, told me last night yesterday was about experience and continuity. We just got through inflation uh, week or infrastructure week, I should say. This is continuity week, I guess, with regard to the Fed. There are going to be some holdouts. As we know, it's widely known that Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, is a no vote. She, she reconfirmed that yesterday in a statement that quickly followed these announcements. We heard as well that uh, Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon, a Democrat, he's a no vote. Sheldon Whitehouse, a progressive from Rhode Island, said that he was disappointed in the pick, but is also looking to speak further uh, with the two nominees and is hoping that Jay Powell may have a change of heart, for instance, when it comes to climate. But those those are the progressive Democrats. We kind of knew that would be the case already, and, and it is expected that more moderate Democrats and Republicans will make up for any progressive losses. The whole idea here, to your point, was to avoid a messy confirmation battle. Okay, so perhaps they do avoid that 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 mess, as you say, Joe. What about what we're expecting in the near the near term from President Biden when he addresses the nation later on today? I was thinking yesterday, how can he do that? Talk about inflation if he hasn't decided who's going to be leading the Federal Reserve? Well, now we know. So, what is he going to be saying today? That's right. Well, he'll be speaking from the White House a little bit later on today, uh, afternoon time here in Washington, about a more broad approach. The, in the, the term inflation is now in the daily talking points in this administration. And as Bloomberg is reporting, that will likely be coupled with an announcement uh, to release some, uh, from some oil from the, the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The question is how much and over what duration of time and, frankly, what impact it might have beyond the short term. We know that OPEC is threatening to pump more. We know that even with other countries getting involved, the market has possibly baked in a lot of this. But it's a strong announcement from the president. It makes it look like the administration is leaning into this issue that everyone seems to be talking about. Not just energy mm -hmm. prices, specifically gas prices, the most visible form of inflation when you look at polling that okay. people are complaining about this administration. Joe, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew with the latest there. You can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. That is the political angle on what's going on on oil. Let's get to the markets then. Oil is declining ahead of an expected announcement by the U.S. and other major consumers on a release of emergency reserves. The move is designed to tame high fuel prices and rampant inflation. Will Kennedy, Bloomberg's executive editor for Energy and Commodities, joins us on set here in London. What a we expecting good morning to you well what are we expecting from america from china from india from japan and all the others uh, morning anna i think we expect some kind of coordinated action as we've been reporting over the last uh, few days that involves the world's top four oil consumers importantly the us china uh, japan and india and we heard from indian officials this morning india it expects to announce a modest uh, stockpile release of 5 million barrels a day uh, at some point today, and that oil will come onto the market in the coming weeks. Now, it's not a huge number. It's uh, less than India consumes in one single day. So I think the action here is largely symbolic. We await the details from Biden later today, and then what China and Japan decide to do. Um, but the real question that traders are focusing on now is how does OPEC Plus respond? Mm -hmm. They meet on next week on December the 2nd. They had been expected to continue with these monthly 400,000 barrel a day hikes. Uh, that's now in the balance. Interesting to see JP Morgan putting out a note, Kalanovic saying that oil is remarkably cheap. That will probably play in uh, to the hands of OPEC Plus as they consider their response. Can they look through this if it is just symbolism? Uh, yes, I mean, the cheap comment is actually very interesting. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that everyone said uh, they need to do this to get gas prices down, as Joe was talking about how, what a hot political issue that is. But $75, $80 is not especially expensive by historical standards. Sure, it's a lot more than last year. But the Obama administration went years at $100 oil without doing this. So I think it just shows how sensitive it is. But to your point, Tom, it means that OPEC can say, really? Is this really a crisis? We think the oil market looks in good shape and is recovering nicely. OK, we will continue to watch this story as you and the team will as well. Will, thank you very much indeed as ever. Will Kennedy, Bloomberg's executive editor for Energy and Commodities. OK, let's switch focus to what's happening in Germany, where Health Minister Jens Spahn reiterated that he cannot rule out any measures, including, including another lockdown. This is, as the country reports, a record number of COVID cases. He issued a start warning to the unvaccinated. Probably by the end of winter, almost everyone in Germany, it might be cynical to say, will be either vaccinated, cured, or dead. But that really is the case. 
This is very possible with the extremely infectious Delta variant. Okay, let's get more with Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo on the ground uh, in Berlin for us. Maria, the German government uh, really up in the rhetoric. That soundbite still rings in my ears in terms of the starkness. Just speaking truth to what is happening, arguably, uh, is it working? Yeah, and Tom, who can blame you? It's not often that we hear from a health finance minister say essentially, or a health minister, excuse me, say essentially it comes down to get the vaccine, get your vaccination, or you face a winter that could be uh, potentially deadly. Now, the message coming out of the German government is very severe. At times, you could even argue this is a brutal message that is being passed on to people. And essentially, the goal here is to tell the population that's not had the vaccine, this is now very serious, coronavirus is a crisis is as serious as it's ever been. This is your final warning. It is your final chance to get the vaccine. Now, the problem on the ground, uh, Tom, if you look at the breakdown of the data that we have this week, a lot of the vaccinations that we're seeing on the ground respond to booster shots. These are people that already had their vaccination and now they want to get boosted ahead of the winter, but it's not first time vaccinations. And that is a problem. Mm. The German government is having a real headache in terms of narrowing this gap. It's the first time vaccinations that is a real problem but again the challenge is that a lot of these people they could have the vaccine there's many doses now for everyone in Germany the problem is they simply don't want to get it they don't believe in the vaccine and they also believe that government should not have the say on yeah. a person's life the question is now whether Germany would feel the need to instinct a mandate to say from now on this is not a personal choice this is really a government obligation you have to get it done Okay, so we'll watch the government reaction, the German government reaction to this latest wave of COVID then, Maria. Uh, we're also trying to tie this into what this means for other policymakers and the ECB in particular. We've heard hawkish lines really coming from the ECB's Villeroy and Schnabel overnight. And then Klaas Knott talking to our colleague Francine just this morning, also stressing to us that the ECB stimulus will be dialed back. There is still a lot of uncertainty about sort of the size and the stringency of uh, the lockdowns that will uh, await us. I don't think uh, myself that it will have an impact on our intention to wind down the uh, pandemic emergency purchase program. Klaus cannot there from the ECB. So, Maria, despite the virus resurgence, the ECB is setting a course for normalization of policy. Yeah, and it's that interview with uh, Francine Lacroix that really got the line that everyone is, is waiting for, that clarification as to whether or not the PEP program would be coming to an end in March. If you remember until now, uh, the narrative coming from the European Central Bank is that this was an emergency QE. The moment the health emergency was over, it was off the way, then it was time to end it. Essentially, it was that clear. And he's repeating that message that what we're seeing in Austria, what we're seeing potentially in Germany, and again, the health minister does not exclude that we could see regional lockdowns in the biggest economy in the euro area would preclude the uh, not an ending of the PEP program. The Dutch central banker is very clear. He doesn't see a connection between the two of them. All right, thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria today, reporting from Berlin. Now let's get back to the U.S. markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading. Zoom Video reported after the bell last night. Revenue forecast topped expectations, but it's not adding as many large customers. We're in the waning days maybe of the pandemic, or at least people aren't working from home as much, so that could weigh on growth in the future, and that stock is down about nine percentage points. Another stock that's down is Aurora Innovation, a self-driving car startup. It was up 71% last week, fell 12% yesterday, and down about 6.4% this morning. So maybe retail traders not favoring that stock so much anymore. Maybe instead they're favoring, favoring iSpecimen. This is a $62 million market cap company that was up 80% yesterday and up another 100% in early hours this morning, Anna. Yeah, not bad for a technology-driven company on two days where we're seeing technology under pressure. Coming up on this program then, a faster taper for the Fed, part of our interview with the Atlanta Fed President, Raphael Bostic, and we'll discuss the market reaction to Powell's renomination with Amundi CIO, Pascal Blanc. Plus, U.S. politics and Biden's challenges ahead with Julie Norman of UCL. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. I definitely think it's it's appropriate for us to be talking about the pace of tapering and being open to a faster one. Uh, we're going to see some more data between now and when we have to make that decision or have those conversations. And that'll really guide us, I think, in, in having a, a perspective on what the appropriate pace is. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic speaking exclusively with Bloomberg following the reappointment or renomination of Chairman Jerome Powell. We're joined now by Christina Kino, who helps lead Bloomberg's markets coverage. So, Christine, this was taken as a hawkish decision. We're getting more hawkish commentary, stronger dollar, higher yields off the back of it. Do any of those moves look overdone for now? Well, you know, Kaylee, I think this is really just the beginning, you know, because I think up until we got confirmation of Powell's renomination, it was kind of, uh, people were starting to price this in, but it was almost kind of, uh, the lid has been taken off of a market's um, expectations when it comes to uh, Fed rate hikes into 2022. Just before I came on, I was looking at the charts and, you know, we were looking at two um, rate hikes for the Fed in 2022, and now markets are starting to price the possibility of a third one. This is exactly what we saw happen in the UK, and now we're seeing that kind of flowing through a uh, similar situation in the Fed as well. Christine, is this really a case of pricing in Powell, somebody that we know very well, or is this just pricing out uncertainty? I think that's exactly it, Anna. Now that markets know who the Fed chair is going to be for the foreseeable future, now they're starting to think, okay, you know, it's it's an old hand, right? It's the guy that we've known for quite some time, and they've kind of started thinking about uh, the next steps here, right? Which is how the Fed is going to exit its extraordinary policy and start thinking about rate hikes down the line. Is the ECB taking baby steps towards the Fed with this commentary we're getting from, from officials that we've been speaking to around what happens with the PEPP program, that special bond? purchase program that some had thought may be possibly extended after March. Yeah, you know, Tom, I think it's been a bit of mixed messaging from the ECB over the last few weeks. What you've seen from them is really a bit of pushback on the rate bets front, for sure. Mm. But I think now what we're seeing is kind of a re-emphasis on the um, bond purchasing program. And I think that's what they're trying to do is to return focus to that and emphasize that they are also in the process of normalization, perhaps not on the rate hikes front, as we're seeing in the Fed and the BOE, mm -hmm. but certainly on that path as well. Yeah, we've heard a few voices then from the ECB just overnight being, if not hawkish, a little less dovish. Uh, Christine, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Christine Aquino with a look at the markets. Remember, you can get uh, market analysis from the markets live team. MLIV Go is the function on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. trillion dollars in spending, not increase inflation. 
by increasing the productive capacity of this country. And uh, that's a very important thing that we, frankly, have not successfully done across most of my lifetime. You know, I've been waiting for this legislation for months since I became Transportation Secretary, but various presidents have been hoping to reach this day for decades, and it hasn't happened for all kinds of reasons. The American public has been rightly impatient. Now we're getting it done, both making up for lost time and laying a better foundation for the future. Let me also point out to the fact that part two of the president's agenda, what I like to call uh, the big deal, but part two of that, the, the Build Back Better Act, has even more that will help beat back inflation by lowering some of the costs that Americans feel most acutely, the cost of child care, the cost of health care, the cost of housing, the cost of prescription drugs, bringing those down while also making sure that we ease some of those labor market issues we have by making it easier for working parents to afford to go back to work. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. On the supply chain, are you starting to see things improve? And if you are, where specifically, sir? Well, this year we have been mostly affected by the semiconductor situation. And uh, uh, we believe that the quarter three uh, was the quarter that was most effective. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now let's get your first word news update. President Biden reportedly is considering whether to send American military advisors to Ukraine. According to broadcaster CNN, the U.S. is also looking into sending more weapons to Ukraine, including handheld anti-aircraft missiles. Russian forces on the border of Ukraine pose the threat of invasion. The latest coronavirus wave in the United States is taking its toll on some states' intensive care units. Several parts of the country are seeing outbreaks that are as bad as ever. In 15 states, patients with confirmed or suspected COVID are taking up more ICU beds than a year earlier. Michigan now has the highest coronavirus case rate per capita in the United States. Coming up on this program, back to the markets, Pascal Blanc, Amundi's CIO, will get his response to the re-nomination of Jerome Powell at the Fed. That and a broader conversation about where rates head next. This is Bloomberg. Now, 
办台的话，他目前有这能力，都有，啊，但是要看怎么一个结局。说我们不做任何挑衅啊，但是说把他激怒了，就跟我们人一样，你把我激怒了，我手上能力我也会发挥出来。所以二零二五是我们研判，要全面，啊，我们这样研判的。China has, I've spoken with Xi about Taiwan. We agree, we will abide by the Taiwan agreement. That's where we are. And we made it clear that I don't think he should be doing anything other than abiding by the agreement. Crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. I think that it's hard to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off this week. And Tom, really interesting to look at how far we've come this morning on the European equity session. It's been a tough ride. We were down mm. by more than 1% on some of these major markets across Europe. Yes, COVID fears, but also fears about um, whether it'll be premature or timely, tightening of financial conditions across the Eurozone and in the United States. That has been weighing on technology stocks globally. Interesting to see that that theme running in Europe, even though we don't have a great deal of a technology sector to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. The call from analysts is normally get exposure to Europe if you want that exposure to cyclicals and value. Is this overdone? A 2% loss across the tech sector? We're wearing up, of course, higher yields in the US, as you say, and modest. And you caveated it correctly. Modest, more hawkish commentary from some of these officials linked to the ECB. I look down the list, though, there's a lot of semiconductor makers, the likes of uh, ASML and Ooh. ST Micro. So they're taking a hit on the back of both the higher rates, but also these concerns about lockdown. Maybe uh, this will impact some of the factories as well. Something to watch. Yeah, the higher rates narrative then certainly uh, uh, lurking and uh, threatening to once again derail any strength, any risk appetite on Wall Street, Kaylee. Uh, we see that E-minis and Dow futures fairly flat, but NASDAQ futures still under pressure. Yeah, it's that tech underperformance that you and Tom were just talking about. Let's get into the specifics of what those numbers look like at this point in the session. As you both alluded to, we are off of the lows, but still, tech is under pressure. And the stock 600, that tech index that, yes, is smaller than here in the U.S. is still down pretty sharply, down about two percentage points when it comes to that index. And NASDAQ 100 futures at this point in time down by about